the nature of being 13% of the population in a country that is couched in deep systemic racism is that your individual status and success can always be taken from you. Ma'am, like, why don't people... <laughs> like, you are not people... imper... You will never be impervious. No. You will never be impervious. And Ask so... Bill Cosby. Small doses. Self-help from the hip. Small doses. We're talking that shit. Small doses. And keeping it real. Small doses. With me and them seals. It's so funky. It's so funky. <laughs> Folks, welcome to... Another episode of Small Doses Podcast. Um, Y'all don't really see me fangirl a lot because, um, I mean, you've seen me fangirl, like, there's been moments. There's been moments. Like, I had, like, a fangirl moment at the, like, real realization that, yes, Tay Diggs was in Rent, and I was there in 1999. You know, like, that moment, like, happened in real time. Like, you witnessed that. Um, But I feel like... America, in general, is obsessed with celebrity and not enough obsessed with intellectualism. And that is very telling about, like, the way we're even going and how a certain individual became president. So I want a fangirl (laughs) for the people I feel deserve the fangirlery. And I am so fortunate to get to do that today with our guest, the... Sherilyn Eiffel Esquire. Uh, (laughs) I mean, I have to actually read it off my phone to give the correct title. Uh, The Endowed Chair in Civil Rights at Howard University and the former president and director counsel, casual flex, (laughs) of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And even though I have never been in one of your classes, you have been an incredible teacher to me. Um... And, oh, am I emotional? I'm a cancer. I'm always emotional. <laughs> um, but I I feel like one of the greatest um, deficits that our Black community in particular is facing at this point in America is our lack of knowledge of where we've come from to get where we are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and thus, I think that is informing people's decisions, their choices, their inaction, et cetera, around yeah. voting, around um, activism, well and, you know, just around their own, like, intellectual curiosity. And you awakened something in me on a Delta Airlines flight when I was... I had realized, like, if I watch When Harry Met Sally again, it was like you, like, like there's, there's Not other things. Not that there's things. anything wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like there's other things, and I, I stumbled upon the masterclass. Oh, um, I think it's Black History, Black, Black History, Black Freedom, Black Love. Like, I think that's what Love I always it. like mess up Love the Love. title, but Love I stumbled that. upon it, and literally, it was like stumbling into a treasure trove of yeah. just. Not just knowledge, but of inspiration. Uh, I will say very wholeheartedly from my chest that the the videos that were done by the women were far better than by the men in this program. And y'all know I don't play around. I just need y'all to know that. Uh, There was an unequal level of intellectualism and the sisters was bringing it. And um, you really, I mean, I literally bought the Housing Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, and the Voting Rights Act. Like, I bought the text because I need to read and I need to understand (laughs) everything. So thank you so much for joining us for Side Effects of Civil Rights, which I think people think they know, and I know that we do not know. Like, I I think that term, civil rights, people are like, yeah, you know, Martin, Malcolm, yeah. And it's like, "Mm, no. (laughs) Right. Um, So I would love today if, I mean... I just feel like I'm speaking to just a, a vast coffer of knowledge. So it's like, I'm not even sure where to start. But if you could actually just start by telling us um, what what is the definition of civil rights? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. Um, thank you for watching Masterclass. I was actually really thrilled to know that it was playing on on Delta Airlines because, you know, one of the reasons I do um, things like that and many other um, appearances, you know, on television or in documentaries or in films is because those were the things that shaped me and influenced me to want to do what I 
dreamed of doing since I was a girl. And it was because I watched civil rights documentaries. It was because I saw Barbara Jordan on television during the Watergate hearing speaking about the Constitution uh, <laughs> in this incredible uh, tone with this incredible authority. And I thought like, that Black woman is like where I'm trying to head. Um, but more than just kind of as role models, as um, how do you get the knowledge? You know, yeah. how do you understand um, the world around you? And particularly in this country, how do we understand who we are in relationship to this country as a people? Um, how do we understand the tools that are available to us to improve our lives? And most of all, how do we understand the arc of our journey here? Because mm -hmm. I I do think that, um, you know, despair is not an option. Right. And the only way to, to um, despair proof yourself <laughs> is to really understand the journey, the yes. extraordinary, unbelievable, yes. noble, um, just, Honorable. you know, a <laughs> stunning uh, journey of, of Black people um, on this continent and our relationship to this particular country and our demand to be full human beings with full dignity. Um, and, and if that doesn't get you straight, you know, you, you just, you, it does because you're part of something bigger. So that's why I do it. Um, and, and I'm glad you asked the question about civil rights because I think we tend to think civil rights kind of starts with this, the civil rights movement. And right. I should say there is a, the civil rights movement. We're talking about a particular period of time that extends I would say from 1954 to 1968, it's a very short period of time and I'm probably stretching it, but uh, that's kind of the core civil rights movement beginning with the Supreme Court's decision in Brown versus Board of Education mm -hmm. and ending maybe the week that Martin Luther King was assassinated, which was uh, in April of 1968. A week later, Congress only by one vote but it, in in some measure of shame, as cities burned all across the country, finally passed the Fair Housing Act, which is kind of the last of the big three civil rights statutes enacted during that period. We had the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and then the Fair Housing Act of 1968, which Dr. King had worked hard on and pressed for for a number of years without Congress moving on it, and they finally passed it. Um, just days I'll, after his assassination. Just a, just real quick, a question about that. Was, I, someone asked me the other day and I didn't have the answer and I, I forgot to look it up, but these were not passed. I mean, the Housing Rights Act um, was Congress, but was the voting right, were the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act Congress as well or were they executive orders? All were statutes passed by the United States Congress on a bipartisan basis. Uh, and, uh, and the Voting Rights Act has been reauthorized, had been reauthorized four times, um, also on a bipartisan basis until, um, you know, the Supreme Court struck down a key part of the Voting Rights Act in 2013. And despite our efforts to try to amend the act, now it can't even get a hearing because obviously, you know, there's no such thing as bipartisanship at this point, and the Republican right. Party is very different than it was in the past. No, all of those were actually statutes passed by Congress. As a matter of fact, there was an earlier Civil Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act of 1957, which um, created the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department. So this was a period in which the, the activism on the ground, I mean, there's a lot of context here, but the activism on the ground, the demands that be, were being made in the courts um, all kind of came together at the same time, um, all following, of course, World War II, which um, I think really changed the game, both for this country and for Black people. It changed the game for this country because uh, America emerged as the global leader, and we had a stake in keeping that reputation as a country. Um, it was the beginning of the Cold War with Russia, and much of the tussle over the Cold War was being fought mm -hmm. uh, through, you know, uh, scuffles that both of the superpowers were engaged in in Africa. 
and trying to, the U.S. trying to ensure that Mm. African countries didn't become communist, Russia trying to kind of engage with African countries and convince them to become communist. And so the U.S. was very interested in its reputation in Africa. And so there was deep concern about how we looked if we were oppressing Black people explicitly. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. See, that's a context I've never, ever had anyone yeah. present. No, no, no. It's The it is, optics were a part yes. of it. Yes. Derek Bell calls it uh, interest convergence, or the late Derek Bell. You know, he, he used to say, he used to write that the only time Black people have made advancement in this country is when it was in the larger interest. Um, and certainly for the for, during the period of the Civil Rights Movement, he's absolutely right about that. President Eisenhower, who famously sent the 102nd Airborne to Little Rock High School to protect the Little Rock Nine and to yeah. see to it that they were able to enter the school and go to school that, that year and the following year, was a segregationist. He, he was furious with the push to integrate schools, but he mm-hmm. was deeply concerned about our position in the world and not giving Russia a, you know, a weapon An to inch. be able to say to African countries, look at how they treat their, that's who you want to be aligned with. Look at how they treat people who look like you. So <laughs> it, there was a national interest in our global reputation. And then for us as Black people, the post-Civil War period meant that, um, you know, Black men who served came home. They had mm-hmm. fought for the end of fascism abroad. Uh, you know, in fact, during the war, there was a kind of a civil rights campaign, victory at home and, and abroad, the, the double V, yep. right, that we needed victory here, too. And so they came back uh, uh, unwilling to to uh, acquiesce to second class citizenship in the way they they might have before. They came back with a with a renewed sense of um, manhood, of 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 citizenship. And. Women who had, you know, Black women had have, have always worked. We didn't just enter the workforce when Child. men were at war. <laughs> uh, but, but likewise, had a, had a much stronger vision. We were supposed to be this country, I mean, the people who had liberated, you know, Europe and who had saved democracy and who had fought back against racism and, um, and fascism. And so to come back home and be uh, treated the same way was simply not an option. And so the seeds begin in the 40s. um, And certainly by the time we get to 54, Brown was a powerful and important um, moment because now the Supreme Court was saying that Black people could not be uh, segregated and that to segregate was 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 not just Black people like to be with Black people and white people like to be with white people, but it was meant to send a message of subordination. And you can pretty much stack it from there. 1954, Brown. 1955, Emmett Till is killed. 1956, Rosa Parks refuses to give up her seat on the bus and says she was thinking about Emmett Till. 57, Mm. we get a civil rights act of 1957. Uh, 50, um, I guess it's 57 or 50, no, it's 59. We get, um, you know, civil rights activism and marches happening throughout, uh, beginning throughout the South. We have Dr. King on his rise. His famous give us the ballot speech at the Lincoln Memorial was actually on the anniversary of Brown. And he gave the speech because civil rights leaders were trying to push um, for compliance with Brown because, you know, the Southern white jurisdictions were refusing to comply. And so then we enter into, you know, the, the lunch counter movement and the freedom rides and so on and so forth. But it's pretty much it goes very fast. And it ends pretty fast, too. But you asked the question of what is civil rights. And so what I wanted to say was that to understand what civil rights are, you have to kind of go back to you could go back to the founding of the country. But you most certainly have to go back. And probably the best place to look is following the Civil War. Right. When the the um, effort was made to bring black people into the body politic, black people had been um, deemed by the Supreme Court in the Dred Scott case, not to be citizens and to be unable to be citizens. What the Supreme Court said in Dred Scott was not only are enslaved Black people not citizens, but even free Black people are not citizens. 
And uh, so post-Civil War, Mm. the first thing that has to happen is Black people have to, first of all, we have to end slavery. So we have the 13th Amendment. Then the 14th Amendment begins with birthright citizenship. Any person born or naturalized in the United States is a citizen of the United States and of the state in which they reside. Right. And so Black people are citizens, both free uh, and formerly enslaved. Uh, And now the question is, what are the rights that comprise first-class citizenship? Right. Right. So the ability to do certain kinds of things um, in, in in that period, you know, the ability to be a witness in court, you know, things mm-hmm. that black people were barred from doing to sue and to be sued, to right. be able to enter into contracts, to be able to uh, buy land, to be able to lease to like, th- these were the things that were seen as the building blocks of citizenship. We tend to think of voting as a critical uh, building block. Um, and they did too. Um, even though we didn't get a you know a, a bar on keeping people from voting until the Fifteenth Amendment, but they did believe that voting, jury service, voting and jury service were two very important ones. So the kinds of things that allow you to participate as a citizen, and it's essentially your political rights, um, are are civil rights. And so, um, Got it. you know, they're critically important because otherwise, in name only, you are a citizen, but you you don't have the full rights of a citizen. Um, and so all that bundle of rights and, and our definition of it expands and contracts depending on on where we are, um, is, is, is the bundle of rights that we think of as our civil rights. Let me know if you agree with this. Um, I feel like currently, when I look at just like the state, the general state of like black consciousness in this country, there is a cons- there's somewhat of a consensus that our citizenship is proven by our access to money and white spaces um and thus these other efforts like voting um you know like being a part of the judicial system in not just a punitive way but as you know lawyers, as judges, et cetera, um, that that's just not as important because now that we have access to whiteness and money, that we have somehow like jumped the civil, like, I feel like that's what people think civil rights is. I'm not sure I agree with that. And in fact, I think I probably don't. And I would say that having an opportunity to acquire the things that are um, markers of of first-class citizenship and success in this Mm -hmm. country are rightfully kind of seen through the civil rights lens, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I don't have any issue with with the desire of people to acquire or to Mm -hmm. decide they want to live wherever they want to live, including if that's where white people live, to accumulate wealth, uh, which right. in a capitalist country is an important value that yep. w- without it, you cannot fully, um, be, you know, receive the respect that you deserve uh, in the broader, you know, community. So those things I think are perfectly appropriate and a- and admirable. What I do think, however, is that um, without wealth <laughs> and without being in white spaces you are quite capable of being a first class full citizen uh should you have the various other rights that allow you to thrive in your own environment you know the 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 point is that nothing should bar you right from being able to achieve success however you define it you know, whether you define it as having your own business that has that and having your own business means, you know, in our community, we love to talk about having your own, but being an entrepreneur, you know, entrepreneurs, real entrepreneurs have access to capital. Yeah. The fact that you just have a business does not mean the same thing, right? So, so therefore, even if you decide, I want to do my own thing, I want to have my own business. I want to own my own home. I want to live in a black community. I want to serve my people. You could, all of those things can be your absolute goals, but in order to do it, you know, because you're not living on an 
on an island disconnected. You are living in this country and we are 13% of the population and there's no, there, that we don't expect that number to move anytime soon. Other populations, immigrant populations are growing, but Black people are staying pretty much at 13%. Hmm. Sometimes we have to like face that reality too. Right. We are a minority in this country. Yes. And so to, to even achieve our own success, we have to connect somehow with the infrastructure, right? With the infrastructure. Because yeah. if I want to have my own business, I, I want to have my road paved so the trucks can come in and deliver my stuff, right? I want right. to have my mail delivered on time so that I can do what I need to do for my business. I want to be able to purchase the kinds of things I need for my business at the kinds of prices that other people in the community are able to negotiate. I want to have the capital to be able to jumpstart my business. And if a hurricane comes through and destroys my business, I want to have access to FEMA loans. I, you know, we, we're not living on an island. So right. the truth is, whatever we want to do, however we envision our, our idea of success, whether it is entering white spaces with wads of cash or whether it is being in our own communities, building our own things. We still but, have to be connected to to the question of civil rights because yes. everything that you want to do requires that you have uh, a measure of access, dignity, power, um, and respect in order to access the things you need to build that infrastructure for yourself. I think that's where my concern lies, though, because I think there really is a disconnect from that. I feel like for a lot of folks, getting the getting the access and the money to whiteness is where it stops. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's kind of like I've, ach I've achieved the American goal yes. of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness by just getting this, not really acknowledging that like what you're saying is, is a, is a just inconvenient truth that like we are a minority and we are still in a superbly racist nation mm -hmm. where how things should be is not how they are. Right. Like, I feel like there's a lot of. Um, well, well, like, even I when add, I see people. Can I add ahead? one thing to into, one thing to that, though, Amanda? It, 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 well, I think the part that's more troubling for me is whatever is your definition of success. If the theory of it is that it is just about you. That's my that's where I'm going. Yeah. Oh, OK. All right. <laughs> that's that's where I'm page. going. Like, <laughs> like, that's where I'm going. That like yeah. I like I made it. I got access. I got money. So like I did it. And it's not couched in the yes. concept of community access. And it's like, yes. like, for instance, like, I feel like I made it through a crack, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and I had to be perfect to like get through that crack to access these things that are typically only allowed for a very, you know, small group of people, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, that is not indicative of black elevation. <laughs> like <laughs> the that that the fact that I had to do all this like squeezing through a little fissure okay. is not indicative of our civil rights being truly realized. And that's what I guess I'm asking. Like no question, no question. As a matter of fact, the people who managed to squeeze through the cracks are the people for whom America has worked out more or less, and it is their obligation. Actually, that's what, I'm that's what I'm it saying. is their obligation. Yes. To force that crack open even further and to put a wedge in the door to allow others to come through and um, and to think about what are the conditions that are needed for our success as a community? Because, again, the nature of being 13 percent of the population in a country that is couched in deep systemic racism is that your individual status and success can always be taken from you. Ma'am, like, why don't people... <laughs> like, you are not people... imper... You will never be impervious. No. You will never be impervious. And Ask so... Bill Cosby. Uh, I'm just saying to say. And so the idea that your singularity insulates you is, is always uh, dependent on circumstances and maybe a temporary thing. And therefore you're anchoring and the elevation of your community has to be part of the deal, has to be part of, th that's what it means to be us, is that we don't have the right to sit in our own singularity and believe that, there, that it has some 
measure of permanence to it. I mean, you could, but I guess I'm saying I would not advise it. And if we are to... <laughs> it wouldn't behoove It wouldn't you. behoove you. And if we are to, to make it as a people, that is not, you know, to the extent you just talked about getting through the cracks. So how did you get through the cracks? That's your story. But there's a billion stories that came before you to make that crack. Yes. And, you know, I say the same. I, 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 I'm the youngest of 10 kids. Oh, wow. I never met a lawyer until I went to law school. What the civil rights movement created was um, a set of circumstances that for the period that I was growing up and going to school, mm -hmm. it was possible right. for everyone in my family to make it, right? My, my oldest brother, who um, is an elect a master electrician, he just recently retired, um, became a member of the local electrical union because A. Philip Randolph, the great um, labor leader who um, was the head of the uh, sleeping car porters uh, union and uh, mm -hmm. architect of the March, March on Washington, pressed the local three, the big electrical union, to open up spaces for Black people. And they opened up a set of spaces. And my brother was just telling me, I'm writing about this in my, in my book. I have a book coming out called Is This America that will come out next year. Fabulous. Um, and, and, you know, my father took him to, to sign up. And all you needed was a high school diploma and to have taken algebra. Huh. And that's how my brother was able. And then he apprenticed year after year after year. Um, but even though there's a doctor in the family and I'm a lawyer, and there are four nurses and teachers and computer. My brother's the only one who really had any money because he was in this union. <laughs> and so he could, he had good credit and he could buy his own home on Long Island. And right. And so now he's retired, you know, in Myrtle Beach, right? But it only happened because there was this pressing right. for an opening, a small opening. And I think they 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 added like 1,500 slots or something, right? For this union, because this union was a ma was a was a dad and son union, you know, like your dad was in the union, and then you got your son in, and legacy, then your yeah. nephew, yeah. So it was all white people, and I mean that's so, how it is, even in the actors, like even in the Hollywood that's, unions, of course. And so what I'm saying is that happened at that moment because of civil rights activism, and 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 the story I tell in my book is that when I got uh, accepted to Vassar College, and they said that the tuition at that time was $10,000, which was insane to imagine, yeah. right? Um, it was my brother who signed the promissory note for my student loan. Wow. Not that's... my father. My brother, because he had the credit, he had a house on Long Island, right? That, I mean- He had collateral, yeah. Right. And so, and so he was able to pay it for, so he's the oldest of the 10. I'm the youngest. He was able to pay it forward. So think about what just that civil rights opening of him being able to get into the union mm -hmm, made it possible mm -hmm. for me to then right. be able to go to the college that accepted me and then to go to law school. That, that What I'm saying is me sitting here saying I was just so smart. I was smart. That's true. <laughs> I was many, But there were many Black women who were smart, yeah. many Black girls who were smart, right? Yeah. Before me, you know? But what it made it possible was the sacrifice and the activism that created the conditions in which for that period of time, we could make it through. Those conditions actually don't exist right now, by That's the way. That was my next question. <laughs> so, which is what I'm writing this book about, right? They don't exist. And so a family of 10 like mine, to try to imagine? No. No. When my sister and brother went to City College in New York, the tuition was, it was like a registration fee. It was $85 a semester. Oh, wow. And and like often we didn't have it. Like they were always late because <laughs> we didn't have the money. Right. Right, so right. They were always late. They couldn't afford the books, you know, the whole thing. Right. But those conditions do not exist at this point. And so when I hear people disparaging, they just need to get off their behinds and work. That's all part of pretending your own exceptionalism. And maybe we've been taught that as black people also to believe that, um, you know, that that if you're a good black, you know, you, you made it <laughs> not somehow, the good black. you know, and, and it's just not that way. So we have to understand and, and we're obligated 
to maintain a sense of community, a sense of responsibility to one another, even as we pursue our individual dreams, which is a beautiful thing and an important thing. And part of uh, you're being a first class citizen because you should be able to pursue your dreams, but you cannot pursue them to the exclusion of understanding that you are part of an ecosystem to which you have responsibilities and which and, and of which you are a beneficiary. I mean, I think that's really illuminated in the efforts uh, that are being taken in a myriad of spaces, but particularly with the Freedom Fund, right? Like here is the Black Girl, Free, you know, here's the Freedom Fund. They're like, we are using our access to create access because we understand the necessity for it. And this Edward Bloom Jack, you know, is now on his next, um, <sighs> on his next effort of evil to, you know, since his uh, affirmative action ruling to, to undermine this. And I feel like um, not enough of us, myself included, understand why he is able to um, even go this route. And yeah. if they, and, and really just the expansive ramifications with, his, his, with the success of him being able to do this. Like if he is able to successfully pull this off, how does that ripple effect again diminish you know, even our, who, even those of us who have the desire to reach back, like how does it diminish our ability mm -hmm. to do so? So um, just for those who don't know, you know, Ed Blum is, um, he's a kind of a, a, a shadowy character. I've heard him described as a stockbroker, a business person. Um, that sounds like money laundering. I, I, <laughs> mm, that sounds uh, like Ozark. He, he, is a, he is a white man <laughs> who has passionately devoted his life to... Um, uh, turning the, the clock back on on civil rights. He is the person who was behind the Shelby County versus Holder case, which is the voting rights case that struck down Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act in 2013. He is, has I been I did not all know of, that. It was him? Yes, yes, yes. He uh, he he is, is has been behind every challenge to affirmative action since, you know, the early aughts, I guess. Um, and finally was successful uh, this year with the SSFA case. Right. Uh, he is now setting about seeking to challenge all diversity efforts, uh, diversity and inclusion efforts. And in other words, trying to create a world in which merely to consider race, to even see it, is a constitutional evil. All right, y'all. So we're going to go to the Amandaverse you know, typically I'm like, hey, y'all want to come and get these extra questions? Come on through to the Amandaverse and get the extra questions. But I'm actually like, I just, this time y'all just need to do it. It's $5. And this time you need to do it. Because what we're experiencing here is, is the wealth of uh, knowledge and inspiration that we are actually in. We, there's a dearth of this. And it's very imperative that we are willing to, you know, take these extra steps. So... You can you can subscribe and unsubscribe, but I need you to come over to the to the Amandaverse.com right now and get these extra questions with Cheryl and Eiffel. And he said, you know, during the civil rights movement, civil rights leaders were perpetually anxious about what to do next. And I just mm. loved it. Because then I chilled. Because <laughs> I think that. <laughs> You know, in Prince Prince Edward County, Virginia, they closed the schools for five years rather than integrate the public schools. So they closed the school. Oh, I'm sorry. In Prince Edward County, Virginia, they closed the public schools for five years. I mean, from my studies, it seems like, you know, the Supreme Court was never operating from a place of, you know, benevolence or mora or more or moral um, standing. I feel like they're they were very consistent in their efforts to uphold racism. OK, we have a country that for. I mean, you. 350 years was making laws based on race. So how is this not, I mean, there are laws still on the books that are based on race. So, well, so if I can just take it to the like most to the truth, the cynicism of this is, and, and of course, 
Ed Blum is only able to do this with a willing Supreme Court. And I should just point that out. When he challenged affirmative, was behind the challenge to affirmative action uh, in the Fisher case and in the Grutter case, he failed. The Supreme Court upheld affirmative action, race conscious admissions. And we should just remember that, right? Yes. He's finally hit the jackpot with this particular iteration of the Supreme Court, but he has not been successful. So it requires their participation. And this particular Supreme Court, the conservatives who make up the majority on this Supreme Court, have um, essentially taken the jurisprudence that was created to address what you just described, which is the hundreds of years of discriminatory legislation and, um, and, and laws designed to keep Black people in a position of subordination. And the ending of that by Brown versus Board of Education This Supreme Court has interpreted to mean that what the court was trying to say in Brown is you can't ever look at race for anything, which is insane because, of course, Brown was looking at race. You wouldn't have been able to bus children to school if you didn't look at race. The very remedies of Brown, right? I wouldn't have been able to be bused from Jamaica, Queens to Flushing, Queens to school Mm -hmm. if you didn't know that my neighborhood was Black, that I was Black, that the kids who were getting on that bus were Black, and that we were coming into the white school in Flushing. That was the criteria. (laughs) That's how it kind of worked, right? And so you wouldn't be able to do any of this stuff. You wouldn't be able to have a Voting Rights Act if you didn't know which jurisdictions discriminated against Black people. You wouldn't be able to know unless you looked at what the barriers were and their effect on Black voters. You wouldn't be able to bring an employment discrimination case, right, if you didn't notice that the person who was turned down for the job, even though they had all of the qualifications for the job, was Black. So this idea that they're creating, and this is why it's so dangerous and and insidious, it is a complete constitutional gaslight. And it is meant to essentially empty out the victories of the civil rights movement. And Amanda, if I would say one thing, I think it's so important for us to get this piece. Understand that everything they are doing, we have been so successful. And and I, and I, by successful, I don't mean we've solved, you know, racism or anything like that. But I mean, we have been moving at such a a determined and brisk pace Mm -hmm. that they are they feel they have no choice but to run the tables at this moment, to turn back the clock. What you just described about the Freedom Fund is that there are enough successful Black people in place to reach back, right? Right. And so this is what scares them, right? It's our presence in white colleges and universities scares them. But don't think that ultimately they're not going to come for HBCUs too. I think they will because they are also aware of the critical role that HBCUs play. And I mean, graduating, you know, black engineers and graduating black scientists and graduating uh, black doctors and so on and so forth. There's a HBCU in Tennessee that is suing Tennessee for money. I think it's Tennessee State. Of course. They're suing Tennessee for money that they're owed. And in the hearing, in in the hearing, the literal, I think it was University of Tennessee or one of the one of the PWIs in Tennessee mm-hmm. said, well, you all are affecting our enrollment (laughs) rates and our ability to meet DEI criteria and quota because too many black people are going to your school. We are trying to sprinkle our little thing with some black people. (laughs) So we can get funding. (laughs) Yes. Right. There was a successful case here in Maryland, right? That, that the predominantly white universities, I think they've had to re up the case, right? That they have been duplicating programs that are at Morgan state and other Uh, historically black colleges as a way of kind of siphoning off uh, students. So we we all know, I mean, you know, a child knows that there is race in the world, but this is the theory. And what they have tried to do is to use our very victories as the stalking horse for their theory about, which, uh, you know, it's not even clear to me that they actually believe. So I think this is a moment where we have to understand And the reason I said we have to understand that they're responding to us, Amanda, is because if we don't recognize that they are responding to us, we will stop doing the things that are successful. I'm going to give you an example. Please, yes. The Georgia voter suppression law that was passed in 2021 
Right. They started working on that law the day after Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were sworn in. They okay. announced, the governor announced there would be a new legislative election. Com- the speaker announced there would be a new legislative election commission, and they set about passing this law. Why would they need to do that? They had investigated their election. They had done uh, multiple audits, and they found, and, the, and this, these are the Republicans, found no evidence <laughs> of substantial right. election fraud in 2020 or in the special election. So why would they need to pass this legislation that they said was for securing the ballot? Why would they need to do it? Think about what it looked like in Fulton County, Georgia, in in the primary election, the presidential primary in 2020. Do you remember the lines of people standing up to vote, standing outside? In Fulton County, Georgia, they stood on line for nine hours to vote in the presidential primary. So when you get to 2021 and you see a provision in this Georgia law, which has gone into effect, that you can no longer give refreshments to people standing (laughs) on line voting, (laughs) they are responding to our resilience that in the middle of a global pandemic, people came out and stood on line for nine hours. Now, if you don't see their reaction, then you'll think, well, see, voting doesn't matter. Now, sis, you won't understand. I'm trying to get people to understand. You won't understand that they are responding to your resilience. And it scared the bejesus out of them to the point that they said something so crazy that not even Alabama said in 1965 that you can't give water to people standing on line. If you are doing Alabama in 1965, you're really going hard. So let me cut. Let me give you a second one. I hope y'all are enjoying this episode. I am learning so much, even just experiencing it again with you. And listen, it doesn't stop there. We were so fortunate to have uh, Sherilyn Eiffel's time. And thus, we were able to get you a part two of Side Effects of Civil Rights. On this next episode, you're going to hear more about voting rights. You're also going to hear about the importance of paying attention to civil rights that are happening right now in our country that are possibly being taken away. We're also going to just talk about the realities around how people are viewing elections, how people are viewing voting for the president, right? I hear a lot of folks saying, I don't want to vote for Biden. I don't want to vote for for the lesser of two evils. I don't want to do this. And so I'm not going to do it at all. And we're going to address that directly because it really is important that especially the ones who have have either intellectualism, empathy, or both, that we all get on the same page and get in tune, all right? We got to have discourse to get on course. So make sure you check us out for part two of Side Effects of Civil Rights with Sherilyn Eiffel Esquire on Small Doses Podcast coming up next week.